The objectives of this video are to demonstrate the use of TCD or transcranial Doppler to assess and give real-time feedback on cerebral blood flow, especially when the surgeons are manipulating critical areas of blood supply after prior supraaortic trunk revascularization, and also to show the utility of TCD to count intraprocedural emboli which opens the door to better surgical technique and even new developments. Ackerstaff and his colleagues have demonstrated that seeing more than 10 microembolic signals on TCD is associated with the presence of ischemic lesions on post-operative brain MRI even in the absence of gross neurological deficit. Others have shown that when silent brain infarctions are seen in the elderly, there is an increased risk of stroke and dementia development. We are demonstrating the case of a 78-year-old male with extensive cardiovascular disease. He's a current smoker and has received multiple coronary stents. His most recent PCI was in March of 2024. He also lives with a pacemaker. In 2006, he suffered a Stanford type 3 aortic dissection involving the descending thoracic aorta, for which he underwent a TIVR procedure. In 2013, the dissection extended proximally and caused malperfusion to the left subclavian and common carotid arteries. With a surgical procedure, the left CCA and innominate arteries were regrafted onto a conduit graft coming off of the ascending arch. A graft was placed from the left common carotid to the left subclavian artery to ensure perfusion to the left arm. As you see, the conduit on the ascending aorta provides flow to both subclavian and carotid systems, making it a crucial site of anastomosis. Fast forward to March of 2024, the patient presented with irretractable pain after a hypertensive episode and was evaluated at Houston Methodist ER. Imaging and symptoms confirmed a type 1a endoleak and the patient underwent urgent TVAR. Unfortunately, the formerly placed stent graft did not allow the overlaid graft to fully expand despite ballooning, so the endoleak continued. A few days later, another TVAR procedure with side graft placement was conducted with even more proximal landing zone, which is what you're about to see. To further complicate the situation, carotid ultrasound showed a delayed systolic upstroke in the middle portion of the left CCA. TCD imaging also showed dampened waveform in the left MCA. And in the left vertebral artery, we see a reverse flow pattern. These findings suggested stenosis in the proximal part of the conduit graft supplying the left CCA. Here at Houston Methodist, we use quad mode during surgeries on our streaming system that makes it possible for us to tape the surgery through the in-light camera or fluoroscopic image while also recording essential information about the patient's cardiovascular physiology, TCD imaging, and other diagnostic modalities like intravascular ultrasound in a synchronized and time-stamped fashion. I wanted to take a moment and point out what the colored circles represent on the fluoroscopy image. A radiology technician creates landmarks by fusing the preoperative CT and cone beam CT images so the surgeon can place the stents and anographs with high precision and also this way lowering radiation burden by making the whole process more efficient. During our case, we monitored the middle cerebral arteries on both sides with TCD. Since both the pre-op carotid ultrasound and TCD demonstrated delayed systolic upstroke on the left side, prior to TVAR, an attempt was made to restore proper flow dynamics by resolving the stenosis in the graft that supplies the left CCA and subclavian artery. As we see in the upper right corner, intraoperative intravascular ultrasound confirmed the narrowing of that segment. Access of the lesion with the wire from the aortic arch was unsuccessful, probably due to the complicated post-surgical anatomy. The surgeon reached the stenosis through a common carotid puncture after surgical cut down of the neck. We see the embolization on the left MCA on TCD as the wire with the stent crosses the lesion.
We also see some hits as the stent is being deployed. After the stenting of the proximal CCA, we can appreciate some changes on TCD. Our left MCA waveform has improved from blunted to one that's matching the other side better. Also, our pulsatility index trend plots are now matching on both sides, whereas formerly we saw lower PI numbers on the left. Low PI numbers in this case were a sign of autoregulation making up for proximal stenosis, which now should be resolved. During the deployment of the gore endograft, we can appreciate on TCD how rapid pacing temporarily causes very low flow volumes in the MCAs on both sides. The low cardiac output during deployment is necessary and desired so the graft doesn't get moved by the large volume of oncoming blood that exits the heart. There are lots of hits on TCD during deployment but afterwards the flow returns to normal bilaterally. We need to appreciate just how valuable TCD is at this point. The only side branch that supplies the carotid and subclavian systems on both sides originates from this ascending side of the arch and if the deployed graft would completely cut off blood supply from that branch we would see loss of flow in the MCAs immediately on TCD. The side and the graft is being moved into place, temporarily affecting flow on both sides. High precision is required here from the surgeons as the distal end of the graft has to be deployed before the bifurcation of this surgically created side branch that supplies both carotid systems. Otherwise, the left CCA could be cut out from supply, which again we would see on TCD. The waveforms here quickly return to normal bilaterally, signaling that the endograft is in its proper place. Ballooning is the final step of the side endograft placement. During this step, there is minimal flow in the MCAs on both sides. We see two hits on TCD during this step. Ballooning in the distal arch directs most of the blood exiting the heart towards the brain, although there is a smart design to these gourd trilobe balloons that allows some blood to pass even by an inflated balloon. Also, thanks to intact cerebral autoregulation, vasoconstriction in this case, there is no change in mean flow velocity despite higher blood volumes shunted towards the brain during balloon inflation. During this state of increased vasoconstriction, the PI value goes up. Although the three-lobe balloon allows some blood to flow through in between the balloons, inflation in the proximal part of the graft causes a major blunting of the waveforms bilaterally. You can also see an embolic signal on TCD. After the balloon deflates, you can see that velocities and waveform return to normal. Final angio shows good flow and patency of the important side branches which correlates with what we see on our TCD monitor which is good mean flow velocity and also nice regular waveforms. The resolution of the endoleak has also been confirmed with the NGO. During our case we found that the highest number of emboli occurred during the deployment of the aortic endograft. This correlates with the finding of Dr. Bismuth and Dr. Garami when they monitored 20 patients undergoing TVR and found that the highest embolization happened during treatment phase, in particular graft deployment. We also saw emboli in the MCA during the wire crossing the stenotic lesion of the graft that supplies the left CCA. The patient was discharged on post-op day 5 and was free of pain at the two-week follow-up with some complaints of decreased exercise tolerance. In conclusion, TCD is the only imaging tool that gives real-time feedback on cerebral blood flow, which is especially valuable during endovascular procedures. We were surprised by seeing some flow during the complete obstruction of our essential side branch during ballooning but it does highlight the body's amazing ability to provide collateral blood supply. 
PCD is also an objective tool to evaluate the embolic burden of various procedures, challenging us to develop better and better technique and equipment.